Palm Sunday. Happens every year. The beginning of Holy Week, the Passion Week. Now, when we talk about the passion of Christ, one of the things that's so incredibly important for you to understand is this passion that Jesus carries is for you. You know, when we think about the passion of Christ, the passion that he carried was because he had a passion for me, a zeal for me, and an intense love, a driving, motivating factor. That's passion. When you've lost your passion in your marriage, it becomes boring. Oh, come on. I figured at least one wife would say amen. When, when you lose your passion for something, you begin to go through the routines or you, you lose your motivation. But when you have a passion, there's something that's driving you. There's, it, it's a force on the inside. Jesus had a passion, and his passion was for you and it was for me. Amen. So as we come into this week, this holy week, Let's not just try to live holy one week. I believe we can live holy all year. And it's a great opportunity also as you come into this holy week. uh, A lot of people, you know, it's all over the nation. People beginning to think more about God. And so I would encourage you this week, there's some people that you can bring on Friday or next Saturday or Sunday. Let's believe God that there will not be one empty chair in any service. And so many visitors coming in. Um, because it's Holy Week. And more people go to church Holy Week than any other time of the year. It is the most attended weekend in the entire year because everybody's going to be holy. But we need to be more than holy for a day or a week. Amen. But there are people that you know you need to reach out to. It's a great opportunity. You can uh, bring them, bribe them, kidnap them. It doesn't matter. Just bring them to church and trust God to touch their life. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, which is a good thing to have, uh, open with me to Luke chapter 19. Father, in the name of Jesus, help me to communicate clearly, precisely what you want spoken today. And I know as many people are praying, help me to do it in the right amount of time. Thank you for impartation into our hearts and minds that As we come into another Holy Week, another time of the year, that it's not just another message, but something that makes a difference in our lives when we walk out of here today, we truly do leave here different than we came in. We thank you that that's all possible because of your word and your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Luke chapter 19, verse 28, we'll start there. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem, and it came to pass when he drew near Bethpage and Bethany at the mount called Olivet, that he sent his two disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, whereas when you enter you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you why are you loosing it, thus you shall say to him, Because the Lord has need of it. Now, when Jesus gives direction like that, there's something that he wants to use. That doesn't mean that after church today, you can walk outside and look at somebody's car and tell them the Lord has need of that. No, Jesus didn't send you to get somebody's donkey. You know, if you came on your donkey, you ride your donkey home. Amen? And so those who were sent went their way and found it just as he said to them. And as they were loosing the colt, the owner of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? That's a pretty normal question to ask when you have a, a, a colt, a young foal of a donkey that's never been used, nobody's ever ridden it, and you see some strangers untying it. It's a normal question to say, hey, what are you doing? And so they said, well, the Lord has need of him. Literal translation actually says, it's Lord has need of him. How many of you know that Jesus is not only Lord of us, he's Lord over every animal. He's Lord of all. And what they're saying, it's Lord has need of him. In other words, the Lord wants to use him. How many of you would let Jesus use your donkey? One, two, three. Wow, we have a lot of selfish people here. Come on. Let's see if your arm works. Come on, you've been sitting a long time. How many of you would let Jesus use your donkey? How many of you know he wants to use your donkey? Now, we already received the offering. You, have an, you had an opportunity to put part of your donkey in the offering. Your donkey is, is what you have. 
You know, one of the things that has really blessed me the last couple of weeks, just people in the church, I was very, very grateful. Uh, when you saw kids camp, you see Jollibee up here. I mean, Jollibee got filled with the Holy Ghost. And, and, uh, and we have many, many different managers from Jollibee that, that come to New Life. I forget how many hundreds of burgers and stuff that Jollibee just freely gave and blessed the kids during uh, children's camp. And uh, in the last couple of weeks, we have somebody that works for a certain ice cream company. And they brought gallons and gallons of ice cream to uh, the FNL pool party. Uh, I think 500 tender, juicy hot dogs also. This is not a paid advertisement. Uh, but they, somebody uh, brought in 500 hot dogs, 500 hot dogs. And, you know, because young people are kind of crazy, they had a hot dog eating contest. I think, what, you know, you had so much time to eat, to see who can eat 15 hot dogs the quickest. You have to do that when you're young, because when you're older, you get smarter. I have no desire to eat 15 hot dogs. Anybody here? No, no, no. Yeah. I have no desire to eat 15 hot dogs. But the fact is just people giving of their resources. And I believe that anything that you have that Jesus wants to use, understand this, whatever he uses that you have, it only will get more blessed. And when Jesus is sending the disciples to get this donkey, he's not a, Jesus is not a thief. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus is not going to take anything from you. He may want to use it, but he will return it, and when you get it back, it will be better, it will be stronger, and it will be bigger. I believe when that donkey came back to the owner, and I believe that it did, I don't believe that a couple days later, the owner's going around and going, man, those disciples ripped me off. Where's my donkey? I believe that when Jesus was done with the donkey, just like he told them to go get it, he also made sure, hey, now you brothers, make sure you return the donkey. Take it back to the owner. I believe when the donkey came back to the owner, that was one blessed donkey. I believe that was probably the healthiest donkey in the city of Jerusalem. And I believe as the years passed, that donkey probably outlived every other donkey of his generation. Blessed. Anything Jesus touches, he always blesses. He always multiplies it. That's why never fear releasing something and allowing him to use it because whatever you release and allow him to use, he blesses it. He breathes on it. He multiplies it. Whether it's what you have or your life, he's not a taker. He's a giver. Amen? So they bring the donkey to Jesus. They brought him to Jesus. They threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice. Say loud voice. How many of you know it's okay to get loud? They began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these would keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. In other words, when it's time to worship, you need to worship. When it's time to praise, you need to praise. Because if you don't, the rock might take your place. I don't want rocks to have to take my place because I'm silent. Now, I don't want to take the time to go into Matthew and Mark and all the different Gospels, but every one of these Gospels talks about uh, this triumphal entry of Jesus coming into Jerusalem, what we call Palm Sunday, where the clothes are laid on the road, they're put on the donkey, and everybody's waving palm branches, branches, shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Understand this, that a palm branch is not a religious, um, it has no religious use. In fact, the very fact that they were waving palm branches showed that they didn't truly understand what was happening that day. Because the palm branch at that time was more of a patriotic symbol, more of a nationalistic symbol. If you look at the older coins uh, of Israel, you will find palm branches. And it, it, it was a symbol uh, of their, a, a national symbol of them as a nation and of them as a people. So for them to wave a palm branch would be like you waving the Filipino flag. 
Filipino flag really doesn't have anything to do with the church. It represents the nation of the Philippines and, and your patriotism and your nationalism. So when they were waving these palm branches, they were doing something in reference because they were looking for a king. They were expecting a king to come. The Messiah would be the one to come back and to deliver the people. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they're shouting and they're rejoicing, waving all these palm branches. As he drew near the city, he saw the city, verse 41, and he wept over it. This is not a... This is not anything that you usually see in any of the movies. You see all the excitement and everything. Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Everybody shouting, rejoicing because of all the miracles that they had seen. And as he drew near the city, he sees the city and he wept over it. Now, when you look at the word weep or wept in in the original Greek, it means a deep sorrow, a heavy sobbing. Not a little tear, not a slight sadness, but a a, a brokenheartedness and weeping. Not that you just got your feelings hurt, but maybe somebody very dear to you has died. There's a different kind of pain. There's a different kind of sorrow. And so Jesus sees the city and he begins to weep over the city. And he said this, if you had known, even especially in this, your day. See, he's coming into Jerusalem And everything that Jesus does is for them. You need to understand, as you read the Gospels, everything that Jesus did is for you. He had no need. He was not lost. Everything that he did, he did for you. And he's weeping over this city, and he says, if you you had known, especially in this, your day, the things that make for your peace. In other words, if you really understood on what your peace depends But now it's hidden from your eyes. Days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side. And level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. See, they're waving palm branches, singing, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna to the son of David. They're looking for this king that can come and sit sit on a throne in Jerusalem. They're looking for someone to deliver them. I mean, this is the guy. They're rejoicing with a loud voice for all the mighty miracles that they've seen. I mean, this guy opens blind eyes. He causes the deaf to hear. The guy walks on water. He can take a little boy's lunch and feed a multitude. He raises the dead. This is the one. He's going to get rid of the Romans. He's going to set up. We're going to have a king. It's time for the son of David to return. They're thinking of the glory days when David was the king of Israel and there was no other kingdom like it. This is what they're looking for. This is who they're looking to return and bring this glory back to Jerusalem and Israel, and Jesus sees all of this, and he's going, oh, if you only knew on what really brings for your peace, not me sitting on a throne in Jerusalem, but me sitting on the throne of your heart, if you only knew what this day was all about, if you only knew what your peace really depends on, but if you only knew the time of your visitation, That this is your day. But you don't. And you missed it. And because of that, the days will come. And what he said here in these two verses, actually 40 years later, the Roman army comes to Jerusalem. They surround the city. They destroy the walls. They destroy the temple. And they tear it down. And they level it. And thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people die. 40 years After this week, he said, oh, if you had only known on what your peace depends. And then the very next thing that he does, then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it. Those who have made religion a merchandise. Those who have caused it to become routine and and, and begin to profit off people's pain. 
Church doesn't exist to profit from people's pain. And then they're buying and selling doves and exchanging money so when people come in, it's a quick fix. And Jesus gets very upset and he, he says, listen, it is written, my house should be called a house of... Isn't that amazing? I've been teaching on, on prayer for the last month. And Jesus said, my house should be called a house of prayer. Come on, everybody say prayer. Prayer. But you've made it a den of thieves. Now understand when Jesus says, my house should be called a house of prayer, what I want you to see is in this triumphal entry, this Palm Sunday that we celebrate as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, and I'm not trying to take away the celebration of it, but majority of the people didn't have a clue what was really going on. They were celebrating for all that he had done, all the works that they had seen, but they had no idea why he was really there. The same day that Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, on the backside of the city, thousands of lambs are being brought into the city. Remember, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Now, the city of Jerusalem has many different gates, and each gate in the city has a purpose and a function to bring order into the city. The backside of the city, there's a gate gate called the Sheep Gate. And so the same day that Jesus is coming into the front of the city as the Lamb of God, on the backside of the city, coming through the Sheep Gate, are thousands of lambs coming in, getting ready to be sacrificed as they celebrate Passover. Remember in Passover, going back to when God set the children of Israel uh, free from Egypt, They took a lamb per household. Well, to celebrate Passover, you get a lamb. So all these lambs are being brought into the city. So the same day, it's actually the day of the entrance of the lamb. You have one lamb coming in lowly and humble, not with arrogance, not in a a stallion, not in a big, beautiful horse, but lowly and humble as a servant. You have one lamb coming in the front of the city, And you have thousands coming in the back. You have all this celebration with the palm branches thinking, okay, he's here. He's come. The king is here. The king is here. But they missed it. Jesus goes into the temple. And what he does here really is symbolic to show you why he really came and what he's going to do. It says that he goes into the temple drives out those who bought and sold in it, said, it's written, my house should be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. Instead of prayer being here, you've allowed things to operate that steal from the people. I want you to go with me to John chapter 2. Does anybody remember what was the very first miracle of Jesus? The very first miracle of Jesus is when he turned water into wine. John chapter 2, verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. So you know the story. Jesus goes. He tells the servants to pour water in here and take it out, and he turns the water into wine. Verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went to Capernaum, he and his mother, and his brothers, and his disciples, and they did not stay there many days. Verse 13, now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and so Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He's just performed his first miracle. Now he's getting ready to enter into really his first public act of ministry. His first miracle... Now his first public act of ministry. Look what happens. His first public act of ministry, he goes into Jerusalem, and he, when he, verse 14, and he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. And he made a whip of cords, and he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overturned their tables. I think he made a lot of people mad that day. 
What a great way to start your ministry. Go to the temple and make everybody mad. What I want you to see is that when Jesus, now we're, we're, okay, fast forward, now we're back to Palm Sunday. Three and a half years later, his last act of public ministry, he's back in the temple doing the same thing. The first act of public ministry was to go into the temple and clean it. The last act, see, most people think he only did it once. He did it twice. He did it in the beginning, and he did it at the end. You know why? Because he's trying to demonstrate and show this is why I really have come. Not to clean this house, but to clean this house. Because when the lamb comes into the temple, he cleanses it. The beginning of his ministry and now at the end. Remember what he said? He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And they said, are you kidding me? Our father David and Solomon, it took them years to build this temple. And you're going to rebuild it in three days? He wasn't talking about that. He was talking about his body. He was talking about his death, burial, and resurrection. That in three days, listen, you can destroy this temple, but in three days, it'll be back, it'll be alive. Why? Because God does not live in a temple made by the hands of man. He lives and operates in a temple which is man's heart. Are you with me? And so here we see in Palm Sunday, the first thing Jesus does once he comes into the city, he goes right into the temple to show, this is why I have really come. He did it in the beginning of the ministry, and now he's doing it at the end of his ministry. To listen to the whole message and to know more about New Life and its ministries, visit www.newlife.ph.